while he's getting set up, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. This is uh, James Tucker. He's currently a third year medical student. Um, I met James a few years ago. As he's part of the MD-PhD program here. He's done very well. Um, I think we overlap maybe a little bit, and he was just beginning right when I was finishing up. Um, something that you may not know about James is he is an avid paraglider um, and gets down to the point of the mountain as often as he can. He has an orange paraglider that he says is 28 square meters. Now, we know James needs to be careful. Like this on Sunday, if there was an accident, the guy got pretty seriously hurt, fell about 50 feet. But James is very skilled with paragliding. <laughs> Much more careful than that guy. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. Um, if you had a chance to see the patient this morning, by all means, please speak up. We, we don't have any imagery of him yet. We've only seen him at the Redstone Clinic in Park City. We're hoping to get some imagery taken of him today in clinic. Uh, he lives back east. He just winters here in Park City. The patient has a very complex ocular history. Uh, forgive me, I, uh, I reversed the sides here. But um, when he was 12 years old, he had a, so he was born very high myopic. At the age of 12, a trauma led to a massive retinal detachment. Reattachment failed. He lost all vision in his left eye at the age of 12. So he's been completely blind, no light perception from that time on, on the left side. On the right side, he began developing glaucoma with intraocular pressures uh, in the high teens uh, when he was about 15 years old. He was well controlled. His pressures have been well controlled on Timolol for the majority of 15, 20 years. He did develop a cataract, which he had removed. S um, subsequent to becoming a phacic, he developed a significant retinal detachment on the right side this time. Fortunately, a scleral buckle was successful this time and returned his vision right back to where it had been prior to the detachment. But being a phacic for that long, his, his intraocular pressures began to rise, um, mostly into the 20s, but spiking and fluctuating up into the high 30s, refractory to very significant medical therapies. Um, in his late 30s, developed some central field loss with a major scotoma from about 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock. He had a canaloplasty uh, at the age of 52, a couple of revisions on it, and it is now successfully controlling his intraocular pressures, usually around 5 to 6, at most 8. Um, but at this point, his best corrected visual acuity tested in clinic is about 2600 though he subjectively states that it's significantly better than that, particularly in the morning. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Most recently, and what bothers him most of anything at this point, is extremely severe dry eye um, in both sides. So at this time, on the left, he has no light perception. On the right, he's quantitatively measured it at 2600, though he says that his vision is significantly better than that when he wakes up in the morning and that it slowly declines over the course of the day. He also finds that if he dilates his pupils, his vision is better. And then he just told me this morning that if he lays down for an hour or two, but even with his eyes open, if he lays down flat and sits back up, that his vision improves dramatically for a very short period of time and then once again decays as the day goes on. And Dr. Tatum and I were not able to necessarily make any sense of, of these things. At this point, our major questions are what's behind his sort of diurnal variations in his visual acuity? What causes his vision to be significantly better in the morning and then decline throughout the day? He says it's not associated with a change in the discomfort for his dry eye. His dry eye hurts him significantly throughout the day from when he wakes up to when he goes to sleep. So he doesn't think that his eyes are moist in the morning and then drying out over the course of the day. Um, and then second, of course, we can't come up with a good theory as to why dilating his pupils would result in a significant change except to say perhaps that there's an ad additional light hitting his damaged retina. His cup to disc ratio at this point is approximately 0.95 or worse. And that I'll open it up to questions. Uh, it, it's 
is probably not even in the radar. It's interesting. The other thing that's important is to ask them if he could see the difference in his business living without a contact lens. He's going on his vacation plan, of course. Uh, and I live in the crack, crappy areas, but um, I might open his view is not, you know, he's plus five or plus six or something like that, but you can really can't see that much of a difference. So it tells us that uh, his sense of vision Dr. Moshevar, could you comment on the on the appearance of this cornea that you saw? It has a an appearance that 
that Dr. Tabin described as uh, cracked concrete. Thank you very much. Thanks, James. That was a great job. Um, so our last uh, talk is going to be from uh, one of our cornea fellows, Jason Edmonds. Um, something that uh, you may not know about Jason, he was a, a high jumper and actually competed at the Division I level for Mizzou, right? Okay. Jason has gotten his whole body here over a bar that was seven feet tall. That's his best jump. So that's very impressive. And he can dunk. 